Hi there. In week two of the massive open online course, Terrorism and Counterterrorism, Comparing Theory and Practice, we discuss the importance of data sets, databases, and also the challenges to gather data to maintain a database. Um, and on that topic, we have today uh, a guest who is responsible for the right-wing terrorism and violence data set um, um, in, um, in Norway. I'll explain a little bit uh, in a minute. Uh, Dr. Jakob Ravendal, who is an associate professor at the university, uh, the Police University College in Norway, and also a research fellow at the Center for Research on Extremism, also known as CREX, um, at the University of Oslo. And he's an exper expert on right-wing terrorism in Western Europe. Um, his current research interests include uh, police repression and uh, political violence and also the relationship between left-wing and right-wing uh, militancy and violence, terrorist tactics and online radicalization, amongst others. So welcome, Dr. Ravendal. Thank you very much. So um, I would like to discuss with you the right-wing terrorism and violence data set. Um, as we discussed in the in the video, um, setting up a data set isn't an uh, easy uh, task. So So why did you decide to, um, to, to get a data and to provide that for a wider audience? So this was this is really a story about my, my PhD, which uh, ultimately ended up being a PhD on, on right-wing terrorism in, in Western Europe. So uh, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with the, the terrorist attack that we experienced in Norway in 2011 on the 22nd of July which was of course a, a, a massive attack uh, and uh, at that point, I wasn't really into this field, but I was uh, encouraged to write a PhD on that topic. Uh, so I sort of started with a blank slate uh, and didn't know very much. But one of the initial things I had to look at was to try to position this attack into a broader context, into the universe. Uh, was this normal? Uh, how, how often do we see this? Is it more of it in some countries than others? And when I started looking for data or information about that, I realized that it wasn't really existing. So that's why I started uh, initially just collecting a little bit of data myself and then understanding that this can be done in a more systematic way. Uh, and, and from the start on, it was it had this international scope or were you only looking at, at, at Norway? Uh... No, uh, I, the, the, I started uh, modeling a little bit uh, uh, on a different data set that's been developed by another Norwegian, Jan Oskar Engene, the Tweed data set, which covers uh, all forms of terrorism in Western Europe since 1950. So I, I looked a lot on that data set and tried to model uh, something similar, but focusing much more on far-right terrorism because the coverage of Tweed or far-right terrorism was, was really horrible. Um, and so initially the goal was to only look at terrorism, but then I realized that there's this universal violence uh, of far-right violence that's really relevant, but doesn't necessarily qualify as terrorism. Uh, so I started also uh, sort of coding and registering other types of violent events. Uh, and then I realized that this universe is extremely uh, big uh, and there's far too many uh, events to be uh, sort of categorized and coded in systematic fashion. So that, that's why I ended up sort of setting a very specific threshold of, uh, of severity. So, so the, the RTV data set, which it ultimately became known as, is a data set that covers uh, attacks of a certain severity. Uh, and we are then have, of course, more operational indicators of exactly what that severity is. But it essentially is if the perpetrator sort of accepts uh, the potential of uh, severe harm, physically disabling harm, uh, then we include it in the data set. And, and by doing that, we feel that we have a universe that's actually possible to cover because the severity is. Uh, of such an extent that it will normally be reported about in the media, which is our main source of information. So it seems like a project that went a bit out of hand. Uh, <laughs> I hope you have, you're have you not uh, gathering all the data by yourself uh, today. So do you have a team available or maybe a student assistance? Uh, so, so how does that work? How do you keep it alive and, and, and up to date? 
So uh, a big part of the PhD was, of course, doing this myself. So, mm -hmm. so the first, uh, the, the time period cover, covering 1990 to 2015, which was the original version of the data set, is, is, was initially coded by myself, which was a huge job, of course. It took more than a year just to go through available sources. Uh, then uh, upon uh, submitting my PhD, uh, it was uh, more or less the same time as this Center for Research of Extremism was established in Norway also a result of the 22nd of July terrorist attacks. And uh, I was sort of uh, transferred over to that center when it was established. And, and that's when we started talking about the potential possibility of uh, uh, updating this data set continuously. Uh, we had some troubles initially in, in terms of uh, data protection laws and so on. So it took some years be before we got it really running. Uh, but the way it's set up today is that we recruit uh, research assistants every year from the university that are helping out with the coding. And I also have a small core team uh, that, uh, that sort of runs uh, the data collection exercise with employees at CREX uh, that, are, that are trained and have been working on the data set uh, for several years. Yeah. Okay. And um, well, gathering these data is, is very important also on right-wing extremism, right-wing terrorism. We see also lately a, a, a lot of well, debate, uh, ideas, uh, maybe even myth uh, about uh, the growth of the phenomenon or changing character of the phenomenon. To what extent has this data set helped you to deal with these uh, questions or these assumptions? Um, are there a number of, of um, uh, research results that you would like to share with us? Yeah, sure. So uh, one of the things that we've, we've seen from gathering this data, and it's important here, I think, to keep in mind that sort of the, the main objective for us is to really collect, collect, collect systematic data. And that's why we also set the, the threshold so high. And uh, one of the indicators we use when we really want to estimate trends uh, is to find the data that we're most certain about in terms of coverage. So in terms of whether we're actually covering the universe of relevant events. And that is fatal attacks. So it's quite likely that we have been able to identify all attacks with fatal outcomes because uh, they are reported about extensively. Uh, and we also, uh, would argue that the frequency of fatal attacks should correlate with the frequency of less severe attacks. If there's a place with a lot of fatal violence, you should also expect uh, less severe violence at the same place. So we, we believe it's a pretty good indicator uh, of, of the universe also more generally. And uh, I guess in contrast to a lot of the media reporting uh, that you see about this phenomenon is that when you, when you count the, the number of fatal attacks over time in Western Europe, it's really been on the decline. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that the data set starts in 1990, which was really a peak of skinhead violence in, in Western Europe. So there was a lot of fatal violence uh, during those years. But the fact is also that we're seeing that, whereas we did see some sort of organized far-right violence in Western Europe during, especially during the 70s and 80s, which is not covered by the RTV data set, but also throughout the 90s and into the 2000s, that has become a very, very rare phenomenon today. We hardly see organized groups that end up committing fatal attacks. Uh, and as I said, the frequency of fatal attacks has also uh, declined considerably. Uh, now we're seeing on average about three to four attacks per year, and they're almost exclu exclusively carried out by, by lone actors. Uh, which ties is that into in, another... in, in Europe or? This is in Western Europe. Western Europe, yeah. Western Europe. Uh, and another finding rela related to that that might also contrast a little bit with the media reporting is this. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the recently about these online subcultures and really, really young kids that are aspiring to be terrorists because they have been radicalized online. Well, interestingly, the, the perpetrators, the true perpetrators of fatal far-right violence in Western Europe are old. Uh, most of them are actually above 60 years old. Uh, and it's typically old men with access to weapons who, who end up committing these attacks. And, and a lot of them are of a rather spontaneous nature, but some of them are also more planned. Uh, but that's also a finding that contrasts a little bit with, uh, with the, what you read about in the newspapers. 
So you see, let's say the noise made by a younger generation, uh, easily visible through social media, and let's say more of the, well, less, um, um, yeah, more silent type in many ways, maybe even more dangerous older generation. Uh, yeah, interesting. And I, I think that's, that's a good example how databases can really help um, uh, looking into uh, very topical questions, uh, questions that uh, are very much part of the uh, public debate. Uh, if you want to know, and I'm also very happy you made this uh, data set also available to the uh, to the public. Uh, and I know you, you put a lot of effort uh, in it. Um, and, and it's great that other scholars, but also wider public can also um, um, uh, have access to this uh, uh, database and use it um, for um, um, uh, for the, the viewers and, and people interested we'll make sure that we have the information about uh, the data set you also develop a, a tool that's also available and the website uh, after this video uh, for now uh, Dr. Raven I would like to thank you very much uh, I think it's a uh, a, a, a very uh, difficult uh, task and I hope you also find the, the funding and uh, to make sure that we continue this data set maybe even go back uh, in time uh, you say you started in the 1990s but also uh, right-wing extremism right-wing terrorism is not a relatively new phenomenon it would be great if you'll find the funds and and, and maybe volunteers to help you to uh, extend the period so thank you very much for this interview uh, and good luck with your great work Thank you for hosting.